open source program offices are also supposed to play an important role in the study uh, policy recommendations that we presented earlier. So I'm very excited to introduce here on stage uh, Jacob Green and uh, Claire Dillon of Moss Labs, who are the uh, session leader duo, um, and they will present uh, and lead the session on OSPOs everywhere. And they're in the middle of creating these in government and universities, so very interested in hearing what they have to say. Thanks, guys. Take it away. Thanks so much, Aster, and uh, thanks for having us here today. So as all our panelists start joining, uh, I'll just to say that Hello, everyone. Um, it was uh, when we heard Satiko earlier in the report talking about how we can build institutional capacity around open source. Uh, it was great to hear the recommendation about how we can build uh, open source program offices or OSPOs to help that journey. So our panel here today is uh, a group of folks who have a lot of experience uh, in terms of open source program offices or OSPOs. So we're here to talk about not just the construct itself as an open source program office, but also how OSPOs can unlock uh, impact for open source. So on our panel here today, we've got uh, Deb Bryant from Red Hat, uh, who's the director in the open source program office there. We have Heis Helenus uh, from the European Commission open source program office. We have Boris von Hoytema from the Foundation for Public Code. <laughs> we have uh, Saeed Chowdhury. Uh, from Johns Hopkins University, who has uh, set up the Institute for Applied Open Source there and also uh, the Open Source Program Office, and Peter Ganton from co-founder of Appel, the European Business Association. So I suppose let's get started. Uh, Deb, you've actually had an awful lot of experience uh, in terms of actually running an open source program office at Red Hat. Maybe you can just help level set us in terms of from the corporate world, uh, what your views about what an open source program office is and, and what value it can bring to an organization. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna actually start with just sort of a generic expression of what we think open source programs offices are so we we're sharing a common definition i did look this morning it's not in wikipedia however the libre office project and open office do come in heavily when you go look so an open source uh program office that we call them ospos now for short is commonly established when an organization which is which is to formalize or advance their objectives with open source they may be completely new uh, but that also includes uh, participating in projects as well as being consumers or adopters. Uh, they're typically responsible for policy and practice in, in, in private industry. That means internal policies and compliance, operational policies, uh, and also practice practical guides and educating. Uh, the way it's set up or where it sits in the organization really depends on what the goals are for the, for the organization. So it's, it varies, uh, but they have a very crucial role in helping the company organizations they are, are supporting to understand the culture of open source in order to help it fully realize its benefits. And that goes to a lot of points that have been made over the course of the day, which this is a lot more than code. There's more to open source than code. It's, it's about people and culture. Uh, my direct experience, much of it comes from heading the uh, open source program at, at, uh, at Red Hat. In private industry, 10 years ago, there were probably three OSPOs. Uh, and 10 years later, we can, and, and that included, did not include Red Hat, ours is a more recent innovation. Uh, but today there are dozens in private industry of open source program offices. Uh, we think the popularity is attributed to the increase of use of open source infrastructure to support IT and also in the interweaving of inter uh, open source into companies' business strategies or even their products. So it becomes even more important for the company to understand what they're doing. Uh, for my team, much of the work we do is supporting the communities that Red Hat works with and relies upon. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of non-code work that goes into helping support healthy communities you know, through communication or convening and also education. We also have a role in helping people that are new to Red Hat as they join the company to understand Red Hat's culture and also understand our philosophy of the way we develop software, which is upstream first. That's, that's, that's the way our work is done. And it's a, very, it, it's a new concept to many people. So when they come in, we make sure they understand how, what Red Hat's culture is and how we work with community. Uh, 
Uh, we also extend that expertise to working with our customers. We encourage uh, co corporate contributions. We encourage our customers to join with us in projects. So they're not just our customers, but they're also our, our partners in open source. So that's an um, important uh, part of our role as well. So generally speaking, I'll say OSPOs serve at, as culture curators, as educators, and as providers of resources for best practices, as well as having a hand in policy. So I just want to say very briefly that my I've been really fortunate. My career has spanned the public sector. I was responsible for IT policy for the enterprise for a state. Uh, I was in academia and I helped build an open source lab that became a global resource for community. Uh, and of course, in, in private industry over the years. And I will say that in uh, I'm very excited about uh, the suggestion that uh, uh, a network of OSPOs be created. I think this is a, a great idea. We certainly, as an example, the United States has a lot of them, and there's 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 a, a social network and a private network around the foundations. But the idea of being able to cross domains, public, private, academic, or research, to me is very exciting, and I think it would be tremendously enabling for a lot of the the initiatives we're talking about doing today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Deb. And, and I love the fact that you've referenced this idea of the triple helix and bringing together private institutions and academia and government. Um, and in fact, we've got great representation from all three angles here on the panel here today. So uh, going next to Saeed, um, Saeed, you uh, were responsible for setting up one of the first open source program offices in academia in the US, uh, in Johns Hopkins University. Um, so Deb has kind of shared how, and I love the idea of cultural curation, but I, I, she shared about how the OSPOs uh, work in that kind of corporate capacity. Can you maybe talk about, you know, what brought Johns Hopkins on the path to setting up an OSPO and, and, and why it's there and what impact it's having? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the organizers uh, of the event as well. And, and thank you to Deb for that really wonderful and perfect uh, explanation of OSPOs uh, and picking up on the theme of culture curator, if you will. Uh, to the, the short answer to why we created an OSPO is that the university has problems that it wishes to solve and we need new partnerships and new ways of working together to make that happen. So within a university context, uh, I think it's fair to say we do many things, but there are three primary outputs or, or products, articles, data, and software. Uh, what the OSPO does in that context is start to treat open source software as a primary research object. And in any university context, what this does is activate various parts of the institution that are at the core uh, from an academic and an administrative perspective. So by saying we are now curating research outputs of the university in the form of open source software, we can work with the provosts and the vice presidents and so on. Uh, if you ask them, do you care about open source software? You may get very different answers. If you ask them, do you care about research outputs? They will all say yes, overwhelmingly. So casting it in that way is a very important part uh, of, of elevating the importance of open source software in, in a university setting. And if looking at the mission of a university, one could argue there are three main pillars, research, translation, and education. So as I mentioned, the research output is, is a key part of, of any university. Johns Hopkins uh, happens to receive the largest amount of funding in the United States. It's about $3 billion a year uh, of external funding. If you look across the entire university sector, it's hard to get an exact answer in the US, but I have heard from several people it's on the order of $150 billion a year. So we are talking about a fairly significant amount of even financial capacity, but capacity beyond that. The translation aspect is really how do you take research and move it beyond the walls of the university, you know, the boundaries of the university. Uh, and we heard, or I saw earlier in the chat about tech transfer, and that is typically the way universities have thought about translation. And in no way am I implying that, that that doesn't remain important. We clearly need to think about tech transfer offices as a key part of working with OSPOs. But what the OSPOs allowed us to do is also think about different forms of translation, new forms of translation. And many of our researchers are very eager to, to explore those beyond commercialization, beyond patents, beyond IP agreements, but rather impact in a more social and tangible way. Uh, in Hopkins, some priorities include municipal services, open access publishing, personalized medicine, public health, and COVID. Uh, I was fortunate to be part of the team that worked on the GHU uh, global COVID map 
we're having conversations about can we create an open source version of that map, for example. Another way of thinking about education is a form of translation. So I, I'm a Hopkins alumnus. Uh, one of the things you hear at Hopkins is the best education is when research is translated into the learning environment. So we are doing that through the Institute of Applied Open Source, which builds on top of the OSPO. It's a partnership between the OSPO and the Department of Computer Science. And we're getting wonderful help from, from colleagues at Microsoft. So for the inaugural talk, uh, Sarah Novotny gave a wonderful talk about open source as a verb, uh, not only a noun. Uh, and Stephen Wally has just finished teaching a mini course uh, in between semesters and will be a lecturer as well for something we're calling semesters of code. Uh, so we see this as a potential progression from hackathons to the summer of code to semesters of code, deeper, longer, more immersive experiences for our students. And just re reinforcing, resonating what we've heard earlier, the course, of course, includes software engineering. Uh, you learn how to be a more effective software developer engineer, but it absolutely includes a lot of these softer skills, community skills, the more holistic perspective that we've heard. And I'd like to believe what it will do is raise the profile and awareness of our students, prepare them better for the workforce, and give them a better sense of what the options are. So one of the, for me, goals of, or metrics of success will be do students come out and understand that working for a big tech company is only one pathway. Uh, if you care about various things, open source has permeated society in so many different ways, you can continue to work in open source but not necessarily have to be in a big tech company. And maybe you can even start your own company. Uh, in the United States, small businesses still account for the majority of job creation that is waning since 2008, 2009 in our current economic crisis. But perhaps this kind of educational experience will let students recognize they can go out and launch their own companies uh, and do so with this much more holistic perspective. So I'll end by saying that yes, we did launch the first OSPO in the University of the US, but we hope it's a model for other universities. Uh, we hope it's a way to continue working with government and companies, uh, not only in the US, but with Europe uh, and hopefully throughout the world. Thanks, Saeed. And, and I know that um, you had been instrumental in, in doing a fantastic collaboration with the city of Paris as well in terms of implementing some of their municipal services into Baltimore. And it's a great example that, and in fact, semesters of code of, of the opportunities for that kind of worldwide collaboration um, that you can enable through something like an OSPO. So thank you for that. Um, and speaking about then, if we, if we take the, the, the third bit of the helix then, um, Heiss, if I can come to you, uh, the European Commission's uh, Open Source Program Office was recently instantiated. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, your goals for that Open Source Program Office, both now and in the future, and uh, the reasons behind it. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you first uh, for having me here, Claire and uh, Deborah and Sayita, uh, for mowing a bit of grass away in, in front of my feet. So I don't have to explain everything about the OSPOs anymore. That was really cool. Um, for the commission, and um, I just put in the link uh, in the chat, the link to the open source strategy. Um, our, our big starting point is actually the commission's digital strategy from 2018. Um, and it sets, it sets a bunch of goals, like making sure the commission becomes digital by default, and that its whole process becomes once only. Um, security and privacy are two main uh, objectives there. Openness and interoperability are the other ones. And for anybody that, that does these things, you immediately realize that, that open source is, is a key ingredient to achieve any of these goals. So the open source strategy, which came out uh, in October last year, is really a practical instrument to achieve the goals of the digital strategy. And the OSPO in its turn, which is created with this new communication, um, is really there to make sure that this open source strategy uh, gets into place so that it's being put into practice. Or in other words, um, we're here to increase the impact of that, of that strategy, to give it form and structure. And okay, so that's, that's all theory. In practice, um, what we're really doing is we're getting rid of the legal barriers of which there are a few and they're quite high in the commission to share our software source code as open under an open source license and we're helping the organization change or rather 
we're helping the people in the organization on the road to open source. And so internally, I, our role will be, will be, will be doing an enormous amount of liaising between DGs, between project groups, between development teams, um, that should be working together, that should be working internally together. And as we are able to remove the barriers to the outside world, we'll be working with public services in the EU and beyond. So externally, um, well, we're really working on growing a network of OSPOs, well, OSPOs or any other name, it doesn't really matter, of people doing similar things in similar organizations. And it's not just in the EU, it will be, it will be beyond. Um, because of course you need to learn from each other. You want to work on best practices. Um, you know, it's, it, it, the cheapest thing is to learn from mistakes other people have made. And, uh, and you, you want to support each other to, to find your path. Um, I, to, to lower expectations a little bit, because the OSPO, let's make no mistake, we, we don't know everything about open source yet, but we'll be reaching out far and wide to, um, to other people so that we can start sharing things and, and get better at it. I think I'll leave it at this. Thanks a million, Heis. And uh, Jacob, coming to you, um, Moth Labs has been involved in for a long time now in terms of uh, working with organizations who are trying to build OSPOs in public organizations. And I love the way Heis mentioned that, you know, the, oftentimes there are a lot of people who are doing the work of uh, what we've described here as being OSPO work. So, so oftentimes they may not be called OSPOs, but, but there's people out there doing it. But maybe you can talk a little bit about um, your experiences and how OSPOs can be used to, I suppose, give, make, you know, policies have impact uh, in the world and, and maybe some of your, your viewpoints on that. Uh, sure. Thanks, Claire. Um, we'll start by looking at uh, Johns Hopkins because it's one I'm very familiar, very familiar with. Um, we're not doing uh, open source for the sake of open source. It's really to achieve the policy objectives of the organization. And the OSPO is, is, is really designed in, in such a way to um, facilitate that in an organizational way. Johns Hopkins user is an incredibly complex, interconnected uh, ecosystem of thousands and thousands of researchers, very independent, working differently. And the OSPO, it is, I think uh, Deb likes to say, uh, helps to create a, a community of practice or a culture of collaboration mm -hmm. to permeate that organization. But if we, I don't want to forget the policy objectives of what the goals are of the organization, and then also what the role is of something like a university within the larger public policy context, in terms of what the OSBO can do in terms of creating a almost a universal interface between Johns Hopkins University able to interface in a much better way or a more uh, easier way to the multitude of, of facets that is Red Hat or the multitude of facets that is the European Commission or the multitude of facets that is, you know, other large organizations. There are already pressures and, 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 and um, reasons why collaborations should occur. The OSPO, I think, gives us a unique opportunity, um, and we're very excited to see how, how this progresses, to uh, allow these organizations to network together and, and really unlock that capacity, which sometimes I think is, is hard to get at from an organizational point of view. Great. Thanks, Jacob. And, and I think, um, you know, this idea of it being as important, uh, not just to have an OSPO, but this idea of the network of OSPOs being so much more powerful to help uh, make, you know, the real impact happen and to share learnings, as Heise was saying. And, you know, I think that's that's incredibly important. Uh, so, Boris, coming to you, um, in the context of thinking about that idea of how networks of OSPOs can, can work together for impact, um, can you maybe comment on how that could help, like, from, from a kind of a city perspective or from a municipal perspective? You know, how do you see that being able to help in the context of, you know, your work? Yeah, well, I think... Um, uh, Commissioner Breton said in his uh, in his talk, he said, well, open source is fundamentally different from everything that's being done. And I think in, in our practice with the Foundation for Public Code, and, and we're kind of like an open source foundation that tries to be like public administration native, so trying to solve that problem from that angle. Um, I think we've really found that this fundamentally different means that it's also not something that can be just done. You can't just create a policy and say like, okay, 
now things need to be open source and then things will be open source. That's just not how it works. Um, because you can make policy, like for in the Netherlands, uh, our first uh, motion in parliament to do that the Dutch government should do open source was adopted in 2002 and it was not the last one. Uh, like that is not enough. And what we're really finding is that for open source to work and to be successful, um, in, it, it needs the involvement of the developers and designers because they need to think about like working with others. Uh, they need to have the ability to work with others. So it, it requires work from management. Uh, procurement uh, officers need to understand how to procure in an open source world. Um, what that means for, for data protection, security, um, and policymakers need to think about like what does open source mean for the way that we can introduce, build, and develop policies, um, and they should use the opportunity to reuse policies of others that come with mature software uh, solutions already. And so, I think what this really calls for is like, uh, um, as Kai says, like it really makes sense to make sure that if you're creating these kind of policies, you attach people with mission, which I guess would then be an open source uh, program office uh, in order to create that coherent response. Because as a public organization, you're trying to make sure that you have uh, more control or, or, or sovereignty or uh, independence. You're trying to make sure that you have lower risks and you're, you're trying to make sure that um, uh, you can like be more effective in what you're doing and that's why you're doing open source um, and, and that needs everyone working together in order to enable that and now cities are are an interesting like you you mentioned cities and municipalities and i think they are in a very interesting sort of nexus point because they are not too small that they just don't have any idea and they're also not too large to be ecosystems on their own they are already very naturally always working together with industry uh, with uh, local private with local businesses uh, with universities Univer a lot of universities have very strong ties to cities uh, and often also like citizens directly so there's really an opportunity there um for this to be developed and to develop uh, yeah well and, and and quickly and we're definitely finding that a lot of that innovation that we find needs to happen in order to make open source uh, a shared thing happens in cities and um, because they are kind of like the the cultures where this, these things grow uh, and then i think like one of the main things that i'd also like to point out in that sort of like relationship of those four yeah the triple helix or quadruple helix are the helix <laughs> with as many strands as you want mm -hmm. um uh, like one of the yeah. things why open source is so great is because it can really improve the relationship between all the different parties. Everyone has their own responsibilities that are very clearly defined and everyone's able to help everyone out continuously. And um, I'm quite excited that uh, we also have uh, Peter Ganten here um, because I think like one of the biggest opportunities here uh, for for open source in general, but also for why you should have an open source program office is to improve that relationship with your, your OT vendors and with uh, yeah, the market, market in general. Um, so I, I hope that gives some, some context from our side. It does. Thanks many, Boris. And a great lead in to uh, Peter then in terms of actually uh, thinking about, because representing the business community in, the, in this group of folks, um, how about thinking about how uh, an open source program office can help that interaction with public sector for businesses? But I'm going to add in because it was it was explicitly called out in the chat earlier. So, um, you know, when we think about that interaction, maybe like can we can, can you maybe talk about how it can help the businesses, but also how it can help citizens as well as businesses and how that whole kind of ecosystem is uh, is self self supporting in that respect? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Uh, I think um, so. I, I think uh, one of the uh, the insights uh, the study we talked about today gave us is that the vast majority of uh, companies creating open source are small businesses in Europe. So I think uh, like more than fifty percent 
uh, of the code is, is, is created by companies with uh, less than 50 employees or, or, or something like this. I myself uh, founded um, such a company, which is now a little bit larger, but not much larger. Like, like we are like 80 people. I founded it um, uh, nearly 20 years ago. And it is the typical European way of doing things. So we did not go for venture capital. We uh, created the company by the money our customers gave us and we grew slowly uh, and we needed time to become profitable and so on. And now uh, we are doing, we, we specialize, we are doing uh, identity management and, and um, application integration software, working a lot with the public sector, especially in Germany and especially in the field of uh, education and digitizing, digitization of, of schools. And, um, and, and we heard a lot of, um, um, uh, on, the, on the one side, why open source is the, the, the premier tool to gain digital sovereignty. It's not the only one, I think, but it's, it's very, very important um, because um, it, allows, um, uh, it, it, it allows for vendor independence, it allows to look at the code, and it um, allows uh, to create an ecosystem of different businesses where you can choose from. And that is, I think, very important for the state. And on the other side, this creates economy. Doing this is also very important to create uh, jobs and to create a, a broad ecosystem of small, medium-sized and also a few large companies without one being the one ruling them all, but having a real broader ecosystem where the 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 the, 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 the government agencies and administrations can choose from and where they are able to switch vendors if they feel it is necessary, which is not the case today in, in many uh, in many areas. We had the study in, in Germany about uh, dependence on on a on a very uh, small number of vendors and a similar situation otherwhere. So this could be a great flywheel with the with the administration benefiting and the economy and the small businesses benefiting. And to your question, um, this of course is also very good for for society overall because uh, if people can look at code the administration is working with if people can understand how things work this generates trust into administrations if they can use it if they even can uh, can submit change requests or or, or, or pull requests well even better and of course, they they can work off, mm -hmm. on it. They can they can start their own businesses if they like. Uh, they can go into business and 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 already have knowledge about uh, some tool or some some program uh, which which then can can be worked on and so on. So I think everybody is benefiting. And now. Of course, why why did this not work the, the, out the way we we would love uh, that 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 or, or it should have worked out for years, and I think one of the problem is that the open source industry is made from so many small companies, and as I can say from my own experience it is very hard to build all these different relationships you need to work with public administrations. There are so many people involved in decisions and there are so many different levels and so many offices and so many people who have a say. And I think the 
the big opportunity we have with, and, and then we are not just a vendor, we have to explain what open source is. And there are many, many people in administration who, who do not understand open source. So still there's the question, why should I pay if it's, if I can download it? How do you make money? Why is it secure if everybody can look at it? And all these questions where we think they have been answered 20 years ago, but they are still there. They are still there. Yeah. And, and therefore, I think uh, these um, open source program offices are, uh, however you call them, in, in, in Germany, there's a, a, a plan to, to um, create a center for digital sovereignty, which is basically an OSPO, mm -hmm. uh, as my understanding. Yes. Um, they can build the nexus between these smaller businesses and the administration. They can explain to the administration not only how the broader open source community with the uh, universities and the enterprises and the users, but also the, the open source industry works. You need both parts. You need the, the broader community and you need the industry. And they, they can explain and help to create policies how to effectively work with the, this industry. And, and this, this would make it easier for the administration to consume open source software because sometimes a small administration just wants to consume it. They are small, they are just two IT guys, no big plans to create an open source project, just, I just want to consume it because it's better. And, um, and, 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 they, and, and they, can, they can also be one point to speak to for companies like ours. And as we have heard, there are thousands of them in Europe for organizations like the Open Source Business Alliance, where I'm the chairman of, and also APEL, our new European mm -hmm. umbrella as association. And therefore, I think they, they might have really play a crucial role in, role in, in, in bringing this flyway, flywheel to rotate and to take off. Thank you. Well, I love the idea of getting that flywheel to rotate with, between helixes and flywheels. We'll be, we'll be spinning yeah. around with this. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you for that, Peter. And it, was, it, was, it really kind of covered off some of the major kind of potential for an open source program office and how it can remove blockers. Um, Heist was talking about that too. Um, I, and I want to come back then to this idea of the network effect because I saw it kind of going up on, on, the, on the chat there as, as you were speaking. Um, and I loved, personally, I loved, uh, I think it was Merkel comment earlier when he was talking about the fact that you know what we really need to do is is you know we've 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 gotten good at sharing in terms of potentially there are lots of organizations who are sharing code and sharing open source software um but we need to get better at this idea of working together and collaborating right which is a different thing it's it's this idea that together we can be better instead of I'm so I'm so good I gave you all my source code um so so thinking about that and thinking about the opportunity for how that network effect through an institutional construct like an open source program office uh, can be achieved. Um, maybe I'll just open it up now to the panel to say, who'd like to comment about what we can do to help that network effect? Because um, you know there was a talk about the kind of creation of a network, um, but, but what would that network actually do to make that impact bigger and better, to get that flywheel really going? in terms of collaboration. Anyone like to comment? Boris. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a community of practice. Uh, and I think, well, <laughs> probably not one, but many communities of practice. Like what, like public administrations are becoming digital institutions. Uh, if we would need one under one CTO that understood both public administrations and technology per public administration in Europe, uh, we would be short very seriously. So the need for collaboration is enormous. And I think <laughs> what we need to do is we, cre we need to create the norm in public institutions to have these kind of conversations with your peers in different organizations uh, all around and everywhere. Um, because we need to, like, in the same way that you wouldn't trust a doctor that would never talk to other doctors, uh, 
Um, I think like we need to have that kind of attitude in, in public administrations as well. Um, and I have seen, for instance, in uh, in municipalities uh, and 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 lower governments that we work with, that for instance, they uh, uh, tell their developers that the developers are not allowed to create pull requests on other repos or or even like treat pull requests that that come into their repos. And um, like they need to understand that that is a, a core part of what it means to develop digital government and um, that it is the part like that's a core mm. part of everyone's work. Uh, this is a problem which is way too large to fix with sort of traditional mm. hierarchical communication where you have to communicate through your bosses, 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 boss in order to get something done. We need to be able to have those lateral communications, those communities of <laughs> practice, those networks of people who are trying to solve similar pro pro problems as you in other organizations, share assets with them, share best practices with them, build on that. And, and only then can we really move forward here. Thank you, Boris. Now I see after is here, but Jacob was just raising his finger there. So maybe we'll get one more very brief comment. We're all being very cheeky, Aster. I'm sorry. Go on, Jacob. Get your <laughs> get your comment in before Aster. Yeah, just wanted in. to close up. Thank you, Aster. Um, there, open source has a culture of collaboration, and so as we look to to create new institutionality in in the in the triple helix and in the in, in the helix, institutionalizing open source and institutionalizing and that culture of collaboration. The benefits, I think that's what that is the, I hate to use the word tool, but that is the construct. I think that it is very, the building block that uh, goes to what the commissioner called for in, in, in the opening remarks, as well as what, 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 what Chris called for. You know, that's that, that institutionalization of collaboration is, is going to serve us very well. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, I'd just like to finish up, Aster, um, but by thanking all our panelists um, for your contribution today. And I do think, you know, this is a really valuable conversation and I'm sure all of you will be participating in whatever comes next. And Aster, um, you know, I hope we can all work together to perhaps uh, move forward on that idea of the network and, and, and to get that flywheel turning. So thank you so much to everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, right. uh, OFE is uh, not uh, leaving the concept of the, the OSPO uh, anytime soon. But yeah, thank you very much, everyone, from uh, what I see as the, the, the cutting edge of open source policy across all these sectors. Mm -hmm.